So think about the example of first contact with gravitational waves. So a lot of people are interested in first contact with aliens. What will they look like? Will they be, you know, on a different planet? Will it be some interdimensional thing if you're getting a little bit more speculative? But, you know, like what will that first contact be like? And my argument for thinking about making contact with other life forms is we have to have an understanding of what we are and what we're looking for before we design the technology capable of making contact. Um, and part of the argument actually comes from just thinking about the structure of the evolution of our understanding of gravitational physics um, in the sense that, you know, I, I gave the example of Newton, you know, unifying terrestrial and celestial motion and then Einstein unified space and time, right, in his conception of gravity. Um, and what he was able to predict from that was this thing called gravitational waves, right? So gravitational waves are ripples in the fabric of space-time. If you didn't invent a concept of space-time, you would never fathom these things could exist. They're ripples in the fabric of space-time, but gravity is very weak force. So they're very tiny ripples. Um, and what happened was Einstein put that idea out there and people thought it was plausible because of all the other predictions relativity made, but we weren't able to detect that particular feature. And it mm -hmm. took a hundred years for us to build an interferometer, which is a very sensitive instrument. They're four kilometers across. Um, they can detect vibrations of a proton on the scale of, you know, like a fraction of a proton. I think it's like a 10,000th the width of a proton. They can detect perturbations due to the rippling of the fabric of space time. And um, in 2015, I think it was, or 17, I always get it mixed up. Um, uh, we actually detected a black hole merger that happened in our universe. Now that black hole merger was an event that happened 1.4 billion years ago in the history of our universe, because it was 1.4 billion light years away. And those ripples have been propagating across our universe for 1.4 billion years. And it is only because we happen to be a planet that evolved intelligence, that intelligence identified certain regularities in the world and formalized them in laws of physics and developed technology to measure properties of those physics, that when that 1.4 billion year ago event happened to intersect our timeline, we actually could measure that phenomenon happening. But what was happening on Earth at that time was we weren't even multicellular. We were just, you know, microbes on this planet when that event happened in, in the past of the universe. So that's an intersection of some really interesting things that have happened in our universe, the evolution of intelligence detecting this event um, and actually recording it, right? So, yeah. um, so I think I think you know you can extrapolate that as you will to what kinds of things we might find in the future. But I think one thing that's very clear is if you have physical systems that are capable of generating knowledge, as humans are and our biosphere is, um, it causes really interesting intersections between what happens in space and time and what gets picked up basically by sensory apparatus or detectors or things. So. Mm. Um, so you were talking about, you know, us beginning as biological systems and producing us. Yes. Um, my understanding is that life started pretty quickly on earth. Yes. That's what we think. Yes. And so Obviously, evidence is in favor of an early start. <laughs> yeah. How is that possible? What, what are the ingredients to make that make to make life? Yeah. So um, a lot of people that work on the origins of life, which is the area of research that I, I spend most of my time thinking about is actually like, how does life even come to be in the universe? Um, think about, you know, trying to generate an individual cell um, and making some of the molecules that are involved in biology now. Um, and I think I think that's not really the right way of framing the problem. I like to think about the origin of life much more as a planetary phenomena, that some planets actually transition into this cascade of open-ended complexity and mm. evolution that we call a biosphere. Um, and some planets don't, they just get stunted um, early on. Um, and then it has something to do with the geochemical complexity of that world. Like what were the chemical ingredients on that planet? How were they being mixed? What was the density? I, I think of it like a density in, in this sort of assembly space. What was the causal density of sure. like, and then amount density of information to actually generate this kind of very, um, uh, this very different kind of process and this different kind of physics that we see in life. And well, so I watched Cosmos and Neil deGrasse yeah. Tyson showed just how fragile life is. Yes, it is. Um, well, actually, I, you know, I, 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 it's interesting when you're working on this problem so much, I come to disagree with a lot of the standard doctrine. I don't actually think that life is that fragile. I think life is one of the most robust features of our universe uh, when it evolves. Because if you think about um, 
I mean, it, it is, we are fragile in the sense, like if a meteor hit the earth, you know, sure. it could potentially, right. But we're not fragile in the sense that um, we are capable of inventing technologies that can get us onto other planets and also allow us to live in air conditioned homes at a comfortable temperature that we don't have to fend for food. And biology has been constantly innovating to basically increase its staying power over, you know, 4 billion years. Um, so, uh, so I think I think if you think about the most kind of robust processes that can exist in the universe, I think intelligence is probably it as far as we know. Um, whereas all, all other sort of events in the universe that we understand from standard physics require specially tuned initial conditions and some kind of ran, random chance of events. Um, mm. Like uh, so, but intelligence is very reliable. If I know how to do something, I can do it again and I can do it again and again. If you say intelligence, are you talking about consciousness or are you talking about biological objects ability to have a feedback loop that perpetuates growth and evolution to some extent i might be talking about both um and again this goes to the fact the feature i was talking about earlier so i'm glad that you're asking about word choices because i think that's very perceptive of you um that um because the words are always imperfect. <laughs> they're, they're not they're very the best. Yeah, they're not the best. I wish we could communicate a different way than language, but we're not there yet. Consciousness, like, as I understand it as a scientist, like the feature of consciousness that's always mysterious and the one that you really want to understand is why we experience the world, right? So, so usually in the scientific community, we separate intelligence or even thinking about neuroscience from the problem of consciousness, because consciousness is in this sort of special bin where we're not sure that it actually can be addressed scientifically. Because, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I'm having a certain set of experiences of this conversation right now, and you are too, but there, there doesn't seem to be any direct way of building a map between what my experience is and your experience, or even directly testing you have experience. Because you, mm -hmm. you can tell me you're having experience, but how do I validate and how do I look at the mm -hmm. inner structure of your experience from the outside? It's, mm -hmm. it's not not, um, it's, it's not, um, it's not that it's a, it's a well-posed problem, but it's not necessarily well-posed for science. And mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, uh, when I think about the long-term future, um, you know, pending we survive long enough, there, there might be something beyond science, not in, like, like science was invented, right. And it's a really rigorous way of thinking about reality, but there might be some ways of thinking that are even better than sciences that allow us to probe that question directly. Sure. I mean, Neil deGrasse Tyson said that the his greatest fear was that he didn't know the right question to ask. Yes. Yeah. No, that's a, that's a, a that's very good. I also agree, but on the, the nature of consciousness, I do think there are ways of thinking about it from the outside, what might be happening on the inside. And the way I think about that is to say, like, if you thought about imagination as something that you want to explain from physics, um, imagination is kind of a weird thing, right? So um, the example I like to give is like rockets. The idea of rockets have existed on this planet for hundreds of years, but we only were able to build them in the last century. Mm -hmm. So is that an example of something that existed only within minds and maybe minds writing on paper, but then was actually physically generated in the universe because those minds had access to that idea. They invented that idea before they generated right. the physical structure. So I think when, when or, I, was there two, two options? Did you so the, the, well, I think, no, I think that's what, like, I think that's a good probe into what the nature of, of consciousness is. And I also like to think of consciousness um, more in terms of sets of collective interactions. So I have a colleague in Japan, Takashi Ikigami, who, you know, was trying to play around with the idea of whether consciousness was contagious, which I think is kind of an interesting concept. Could you learn consciousness from interacting with another physical system? So in the context of like, could we teach robots to be conscious by interacting with us in a meaningful interaction? Um, but I, and that raised for me interesting questions about are we only conscious, like even though consciousness is an internal thing, maybe we're only experiencing consciousness because it's actually a collective property. It, has, it requires groups of minds interacting because it's actually about the information we exchange with each other that actually is our conscious awareness. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I think those are all sort of plausible ways of maybe formalizing theories of consciousness that could be tested. Um, particularly the imagination when like, if you imagine that counterfactuals, things I could imagine could exist, but don't exist now could be caused to exist by an entity that could, you know, a physical thing like me that can invent them. I mean, 
the reason I think about it this way is exactly what you do when you're trying to make a theory of reality, right? So when, when you're trying to sit down and you're trying to say, I'm looking at all of the patterns that I see across all life, all the ways that we talk about it. And I'm trying to make an abstraction, a set of ideas that allows us to now control that phenomena, <laughs> not control it, but like actually understand it in a way that we can now use it for right. different things. And and gravity, again, is the example. Like, why can we watch satellite, launch satellites into space right now? We can do it because we looked at a certain set of patterns in the world and we were able to come up with this abstraction that explains a large class of them, all the things that are gravitationally interacting. And then we use that to develop technology to be able to do things we were never able to do in our history. Uh, same thing with time. I mean, like the invention of clocks and the progression of our ability to use clocks and keep track of time. I mean, seconds we take for granted now. It's like, you know, seconds are passing when we're doing things. But for most of human history, the idea of a second was impossible because they had no, no idea, no capacity to keep a record of a second. Mm -hmm.